to the Dynamite Explorers program. Uh, this is week three. My name is Anna, and let's get going. So last time we learned all about the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, so if you guys missed it, make sure that you find it and check it out on our YouTube channel. Um, now this week we're going to learn about the biggest flying reptile of prehistoric times, Quetzalcoatlus. Now, when and where did Quetzalcoatlus live? So Quetzalcoatlus lived 72 to 66 million years ago during the late Maastrichtian age of the Upper Cretaceous period. And they lived in this area that we know today to be Southern North America. Um, but at the time it would have been referred to as Laramidia. Now this might sound familiar. And yes, they lived in a similar area to the Tyrannosaurus Rex and they lived during about the same time as the Tyrannosaurus Rex, but they were around for about 4 million years more than the T-Rex you guys remember from last week, last time. Now, if you guys remember this chart, remember this is the whole Mesozoic era and we read it from going over here in this corner all the way to this corner. We go up and then up and then up again. Now this arrow points to the time period when the Quetzalcoatlus lived and they lived in the same time period as the T-Rex. So they lived in this area. Now, if you guys remember these from last week too, we have the past on the left and we have the present on the right. Now this is what North America looked like in the past and they lived in the southern part of Laramidia which is where these arrows are pointing out right here. So Quetzalcoatlus lived in this area down here and T-Rex lived in this upper area over here but they lived down here and in the present we live right here. Now if you guys notice this looks like pretty much the same area right? Well how did the Quetzalcoatlus get its name? So it's pronounced Quetzalcoatlus, and their name comes from the Aztec, Aztec feathered serpent god Quetzalcoatl. And they were given this name because their initial description resembled this Aztec feathered serpent god in such a similar way that they decided to just name the dinosaur after it. So we talked about on the map right here. These areas look pretty similar, right? So we have here Texas and where the arrows are pointing at here, this looks an awful lot like Texas. So when was Quetzalcoatlus discovered? And the Quetzalcoatlus was actually first found and excavated in 1971 in Western Texas in Big Bend National Park by a man named Douglas A. Lawson. So you see the arrows here, this is Texas right here in the red. And look at the arrows, they're pointing right at where Big Bend National Park is. So we live over here in the middle of Texas, but this is the area where Quetzalcoatlus was discovered. Um, now, since that time, only really small fragments of the fossils have been found um, and they've been preserved in non-marine sediments. So they have never been able to find a full fossilized skeleton of the Quetzalcoatlus, um, but they've been able to find enough pieces of them that they think they know about how this dinosaur would have lived. So what did the Quetzalcoatlus look like? Now, the Quetzalcoatlus was part of a group of dinosaurs called pterosaurs, um, and they were distant cousins of other land dinosaurs. So they weren't quite a bird, they weren't quite a reptile, so they were considered to be flying reptiles. They were put in their very own group. Um, and each limb that the Quetzalcoatlus had, so they had four limbs, they had their two hind limbs, and then they had their two front limbs. Um, they had three digits, which are their, their fingers, on each limb, and each digit had really sharp claws on the end. So you can kind of see here, they had really super sharp claws on the ends. They also had a massive beak. So their beak could grow up to eight feet long, which is really, really, really long. So you think about a lot of humans, like their average height, probably five to six feet. And their beak was three, two or three feet bigger than that. They had a really huge beak and it was super, super sharp and it was really pointed. So you can see it comes to this point right here on the end. It was really sharp. And this was likely to help them probe deeper into the water to get some of their food or other decaying dinosaurs to retrieve their food. And they had very enormously long wings that were really narrow. You can see how thin they are here with the different colors. And they actually had going all the way down here, all the way down their wing, they had a fourth finger, a fourth digit that went all the way along the top of their wing. 
and their wingspan was anywhere from 33 to 36 feet. So if a human is six feet tall, their wingspan was six people standing on top of each other. It was huge. Now, this is another picture of what the Quetzalcoatlus looked like. And they could grow up to 16 feet tall, which is the same size as a fully grown adult giraffe. You guys know how tall giraffes are. And a Quetzalcoatlus could be just as tall as a giraffe. Um, but for their size, they were really lightweight. Um, so birds today um, have hollow bones, um, which helps them fly a little bit better. It makes them very lightweight. And scientists think that the Quetzalcoatlus was actually the same. And they would only, they would grow anywhere from like 200 to 500 pounds, which for something that's the size of a giraffe, that's very lightweight. Adult giraffes grow to be about 1800 pounds. So the Quetzalcoatlus was extremely lightweight, but it's because scientists think that they had hollow bones, just the same way that birds nowadays do. So what did the Quetzalcoatlus eat? And the Quetzalcoatlus was most likely the dinosaur world's stork. So storks and vultures of today were hunters and scavengers, um, and they would have used their immense wings to soar high above the ground and look for prey. So just the same way that you see vultures and storks flying over things and looking for their next prey, the Quetzalcoatlus would have done the same thing. So this is like a artist's depiction of what a Quetzalcoatlus would have done. So you can see them here. They're thought to have been skimmers. So they would have flown over these freshwater systems and like rivers or lakes or even like along the coastline of um, the ocean um, to look for their prey. And they had really good eyesight. They had super keen eyes and that would have been able to spot their prey from far away. Um, but they had the one thing is that their neck didn't move very well, so it kind of locked into place. Um, so they probably weren't able to turn their heads very much. And they were probably kind of stuck in this one position, which is kind of weird. Um, but they had they didn't have any teeth either, so their jaws were toothless. So in their beaks here, you won't notice any teeth. Um, but this would have helped them probe further into the water or into their prey in order to get their food. So how fast was the Quetzalcoatlus? Well, in short bursts and at full speed, they would have been able to fly about 80 miles an hour, um, which is about as fast as cars go on the highway. It's <laughs> really, really fast. But since they were really enormous, they were most likely just gliders in the same way that vultures or albatrosses or storks are today. So if you ever notice a vulture that's just kind of gliding around in the air, it would have been pretty similar to what the Quetzalcoatlus did. And when they were gliding still, they would have moved about 50 to 60 miles per hour, which is still pretty fast. So some fun facts about the Quetzalcoatlus. So Quetzalcoatlus babies were born in eggs, just like other birds and reptiles um, today. Um, but these eggs were really unique. Um, and they were soft and leathery. Um, so this means that they were actually able to absorb nutrients from the ground. So when the Quetzalcoatlus would lay their eggs, they were actually able to get some nutrition from the ground. Um, and other reptiles today who have similar eggs um, are snakes and lizards. So their eggs can do the same thing. They're really soft and leathery and they're not hard like the eggs that you normally see at the grocery store. Um, and additionally, many scientists think that the wing bones of a Quetzalcoatlus were already so well formed that as soon as their babies hatched, they were actually ready to fly. So think about that. You have a little baby Quetzalcoatlus in one of these eggs, and they got so many nutrients from the ground that their body was able to be so well formed that they could just fly right away. Now, this is really kind of cool. So even though the Quetzalcoatlus was considered to be a bipedal um, and they would mostly use their enormous wings to get around, they actually had the ability to walk on all fours. So you see in this little short video here, they have their hind legs that they're walking on, but then they're actually using their front limbs to walk on them as well. So they could walk on all four limbs. And when they would walk, you can notice this, they had their wings were bent up. So even though when they flew, their wings were all the way stretched out, when they would walk on the ground, their wings actually bent going up. So that is it for the Quetzalcoatlus. And since we are all finished with this dinosaur, we're going to put them on the map. So 
as a reminder, each week we are going to add the next dinosaur. And then at the end, um, we'll have all the dinosaurs on the world map um, to show where they would have lived. I'll put it into perspective a little bit on where the dinosaurs lived. So we have the T-Rex from last week. And then right here is the Quetzalcoatlus. So next time, tune in. We're gonna explore a brand new dinosaur. Um, and we are going to look at one of the most famous plant eating dinosaurs and who, someone who's considered to be the rhinoceros of the dinosaur world. So next week, tune in. We're gonna be looking at the Triceratops. And thank you guys for tuning in and we'll see you next time.